um, hi, I'm going to talk about this today three. If anyone hap of you happens to take good photos today, uh, let me know. Uh, go to ten once um, from the event to show how cool it is. Uh, I'm uh, Daniel Stenberg. I got a medal from the Swedish King <laughs> in 2017 for uh, my work with a, a little tool uh, called Curl that I've been working with in, uh, well, I would say uh, 23 years by now. I've been doing HTTP and the Internet Protocols since then. Quite a long time by now. Um, uh, and I've been involved in the IETF since about 10 years, ITF being one of the main organizations that are working with protocols and standardization, and it's the main organization behind HTTP 3 also. I worked at Mozilla with Firefox for five years, and I quit uh, last December, uh, and I will join WolfSSL and continue doing internet protocols going forward. And this talk is about HTTP 3 and HTTP 3 is not a something just I came up with. There are a lot of known brands behind HTTP 3 and in the IETF, in the quick working group, basically representatives of all these uh, big HTTP web providers are involved. Basically, I don't know, a large portion of the websites and the web traffic of today are involved in this. So today I'm going to explain to you a little bit about HTTP 1, 2 and 3 how we come to sort of travel this road. And some details, just to remind you about some details about TCP and TLS, and some of those problems that we get with HTTP2. Um, and how we can't fix this by fixing TCP, and therefore we introduce Quick, and a little bit how Quick works. And HTTP3 is HTTP over Quick. And it's coming soon. And I'm going to tell you about it. So um, I'm going to talk about networking and networking protocols here. So I assume that most of you actually understand networking in general. We don't have to discuss specifics, but networking, you know, bits and bytes over the wire, fun stuff. I'm not going to uh, discuss a lot of bytes and bits because uh, I'm going to talk about the protocol in broader terms here. And uh, some details may change here because this isn't the final specification yet. It's supposed to ship this summer. This is based on the drafts so done so far, and there have been 17 drafts up to this point. There will be a few more, I'm sure, before the final one. And sure, uh, go ahead and interrupt and ask if I'm uh, unclear or, or just vague or stupid. Or <coughs> so interrupt and ask, and we can address it at any point. There will be some time after my presentation as well that we can discuss HTTP3 or whatever HTTP we can uh, imagine and have fun with. Um, I'm not in a hurry to go home. <laughs> so, HTTP started out back in the old days, back in the 1990s with HTTP1. It actually was, uh, the first specification was published in 1996, HTTP1.0. Uh, and I mean, we used HTTP before 1.0 was published as well. And HTTP 1.1 was published in uh, 1999, so a long time ago, and then we did HTTP 2, it was published in 2015, so it was just not that long ago, and now we're talking HTTP 3 already. Um, and why are we talking HTTP 3 already? <coughs> so, uh, the little history lesson here. HTTP, it works over TCP, right? At least in the, the fundamental part. TCP, I decide here to illustrate as a little chain with links. Um, so, you know, those are links. When you send data over TCP, it ends up in the other end in that order, or it doesn't end up at all, but it's a reliable transport. Uh, it establishes a connection, and you send data. There's a three way handshake, ping pong, ping, to establish a connection. And, you know, we resend lost packages to make sure that it's a reliable connection. It actually ends up in the other end. And uh, yeah, it's a reliable byte stream. Easy peasy. And it's in clear text, right? You don't know that you're actually talking to the right server in the other end. It could be a, a man in the middle. And anyone on the network can actually read your traffic. There's no security and there's no privacy at all. That's TCP. It was made in the 1970s, right? The first RFC for TCP, so RFC 783, 
published 1981. That's even before DNS. So it's been with us for quite a long time. And nowadays, we're not only talking HTTP, right? We're talking HTTPS. HTTPS being TCP plus TLS. And then we do HTTP over that. And if we're looking on, on, um, for some data on the web today, we can see that this is data from uh, Mozilla, Firefox usage. Uh, the number of page, or the percentage of page loads done over HTTPS on the internet today. Uh, the trend is going up, up, up. It's around, well, all users is the big blue here. About 80% soon at least there to the end of last year. Maybe it's 80% now. So a lot of HTTPS traffic. Uh, the same graph from the, the Chrome development team, they show that split differently, split on platform and on continents, basically. It's the same trend. Slightly different numbers, but it's the same thing. It's going up, 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 up. It's around 80%, slightly less, but it doesn't really matter. A majority of all page loads here are done over HTTPS. That's, there's, no, uh, there's no doubt about it, and it's going up. It's going to be even more. We're looking into a future with, with HTTPS. HTTPS, then, uh, HTTP 1 and HTTP 2 uses HTTPS done with TLS, right? TLS over TCP. Nice. And that's short for transport, basically. Yeah. There's an additional handshake to, you know, you establish the TCP connection and then you establish a TLS sort of connection on top of that. And in TLS, before 1.3, there were even a few hand back and forth to get that connection done. So we, on top of the three way for TCP, you add a couple of more for TLS. So there's a lot of back and forth. But TLS then, of course, adds both privacy and security to the connection. You know who you're talking to, and nobody else can read your traffic. Fine stuff. So, HTTP done over TCP. That's, that's how it's been since forever, since we started this in the 1990s. And HTTP 1.1 then, just to reiterate the situation, <clears throat> it was shipped in June 99. And to fix, to really operate the, um, on the web today, especially, with, if you're doing a browser or anything really over HTTP, you open a lot of parallel TCP connections to handle parallel uh, and doing things simultaneously. You want to download many images. You don't want them one by one. You want them all at the same time. You open a lot of TCP connections. And doing a browser today, if you're doing it with HTTP 1.1, it's a huge waste of TCP. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a really inefficient use of TCP. For example, if you look at Firefox uses in, on average, it uses each connection once to do one uh, HTTP request before it closes the connection again. Because it opens so many connections, and it uses them, and it has to close them again because it can't keep them all open. So it's, it's um, and uh, TCP has a slow um, start. You know, in the, when you set up a connection, it's a slow start period before it gets up to full speed. And with HTTP 1.1, you very rarely actually get up to full speed. You just get stuck in that slow start period before you close it again and open a new one. Also then, to limit the number of TCP connections you're using when you're doing HTTP 1.1, you, you, um, most browsers typically limit that to five, con six connections per host name. Uh, then you end up with a fun HTTP head of line blocking problem, which means that if you're using all those six connections and you want to send a seventh request, you have to wait for another HTTP request to finish before you can send off the seventh. So which of the connections are you going to wait on? Or, yeah, it, it's a problem we call HTTP head of line blocking that exists, which one of one. And of course, you can do a lot of fun workarounds to fix the small issues we have with one that one. And people have done that all through the 90s and all today. They still exist today, right? You invent new host names, you do spriting, inlining, uh, all sorts of fun tricks. But we created HTTP2 uh, to solve a lot of those, to make you not have to use a lot of those workarounds. Now you can actually use a protocol that basically embeds those workarounds in the protocol instead. It shipped in May to 2015. So now we can use one single TCP connection for one host. And we just send a lot of parallel 
streams. That's why it's a stream of the image behind. Uh, uh, so there is a lot of parallel streams then over this physical connection. Typically, uh, <laughs> the default is 100, and for some. Uh, for some reason, then almost the entire internet uses 100 as the maximum number of streams. Um, but yeah, so you can do 100 parallel streams. That's really fancy. So you can do get all those images at, in parallel. Really nice. And instead, we ran into another little issue. Then we caused a TCP header line blocking problem, which basically then is that when you you're doing a lot of streams over a single TCP connection, when you lose one packet that belongs to that TCP connection. All of the streams have to wait because we need to retransmit the single packet. And then once that packet arrives, we can continue with all the streams because that's how TCP works. It's that chain. We lose one link, everything has to wait. TCP out of line blocking. At the same time, we have this development on the internet and network devices in general that we call, call ossification. And this is basically like this. The internet is full of boxes. Really. And there are um, boxes like this, you know, routers, gateways, firewalls, load balancers, all, all sorts of boxes everywhere. Uh, even we have our own boxes at home, right? We have a cable modem or a gateway, a router, Wi-Fi, whatever. A lot of things. And these things, they run net, uh, software to handle network data, and they typically are written to handle networks and protocols as they work today, or usually actually how they worked five years ago when they wrote it, or 10 years ago when they started it. And they, they're usually not uh, made to handle protocol that, protocols that, are sort of, that we develop today or that we ship tomorrow. That means that if you try to do something new with an old protocol, they don't know about that, so they throw it away. <clears throat> and typically, these middle boxes, they upgrade much, much slower than anything on the edges. We upgrade our clients, you know, every day, basically. Chrome updates itself all the time. We don't have to do anything. We have a new version today, a new version tomorrow, all the time. And it's, it's not as fast, but it's similar in the server end. Everyone can upgrade their server. Some, some can, some do, but in between, there are a lot of boxes that they don't upgrade at all, basically. Well, decades or many, many years, at least. It causes this situation. So I'm just gonna illustrate with a nice little picture with a set of pictures. So this is me, and when I talk to these, my server over there, all these are middle boxes. They are stuck in time forever. We can change them and nobody will change them. They're just there. They know how things work or worked before. This effect, ossification, and then, and I got to see it twice as a bonus because I like it so much. Uh, no, but, so this ossification, it means that these boxes that are never upgraded, they make sure that we never do HTTP in clear text over the internet. For example, because you know, HTTP one was the, in, in clear text, it was done over TCP in <coughs> port 80. That's how you send a HTTP request, get slash HTTP one, blah, blah, and a response back. But if you try to send HTTP two over TCP on port 80, there are boxes out there, they know that that's wrong, right? It's the HTTP one over TCP port 80. So they will either throw it away, they will damage the traffic or some other combination in between. It makes it really, really hard to do HTTP2 in clear text over the internet, so nobody does. It's really hard to do uh, TCP improvements. For example, the TFO it is, is a TCP fast open with each, uh, invention to improve how we do handshakes with TCP, to speed it up, actually, to send data earlier in the TCP handshake. And to do that, you have to change how TCP works, right? You have to actually set a few bits in the header when you set up a TCP connection. And enough number of middle boxes, they know that is, that's wrong. You don't set those bits to one, they should be zero. So they throw that away, which basically is the opposite effect with TFO, that it's not the TCP fast open, it'll be the TCP slow open because the boxes have thrown away a few of the packets, so we have to resend them after a while. This is a huge pain because it basically means then that mm, we don't use TFO either because it's, it really doesn't work. <clears throat> and this goes on and on. 
things that have appeared on the network once, they have sort of, it gets stuck in time. TCP, UDP replacement. If we would introduce a new protocol today, or a new protocol 10 years ago, and we would introduce it next to these protocols, right? TCP, UDP, and my new protocol thing. You know, that's just a number field in the IP header, which is the next protocol coming here. Two numbers are the only numbers that any equipment know about. So if you try to introduce another protocol here, the, those packets won't arrive in the other end because some boxes in between usually throw them away because unknown stuff. So this really hampers future innovations or innovations today to change these, these things. It's really hard. Or you can do the innovations in small controlled networks where you know how things work and you can sort of deal with it. But over the wild internet, then it's really hard. Unless you encrypt the data, right? Hide it from everyone in between. They don't know what it is, they can throw it away. So that's what we do. We improve then protocols in spite of this ossification, like QUIC, which is an attempt then to do this. QUIC is a new transport protocol. It's a TCP replacement. And I, I just mentioned that we don't uh, introduce new protocols, TCP or UDP, but we do that anyway, right? And uh, this is built on a, an experiment and uh, experiences from Google. They did this. They basically shipped uh, HTTP2 frames sent over UDP. I call it quick. They sh deployed this in the they went public with this in 2013, so I think they had it in-house before that. But anyway, this is basically, they basically show that instead of sending everything over to TCP, they could just write their own TCP-like layer and send it over UDP, and it ends up in the end run, we translate it to HTTP2 again, and it works. And when you're Google, you have quite a few clients, and you have quite a few servers, so it's an excellent position to actually test drive this on, on the internet with real users and prove that it works. And they could iterate and try out different things. And yeah, it was good. So they took this to the IETF in 2015, which happens to be the same year, right, that HP2 shipped. I think they did this just the month after or so. So they did this with the purpose of, yeah, we have proven that quick works, we can do HP things over UDP at scale, let's make a standard out of this. It took a while, but then the ITF put together a quick working group in 2016 and said, sure, let's standardize this so that we all can do quick implementations. And from there on, we don't talk about Google Quick anymore. Well, we can, but um, when it was um, ad adopted by the quick working group in the ITF, a lot of decisions were made, and one of the decisions was this is it sounds like a great idea, but we shouldn't do it only for HTTP. And this thing that Google did was sort of everything, but it was only, it was a layer violation, deluxe, everything crammed into one blob and out came HTTP. But when the ITF took it, they wanted to make it into proper transport protocol and an application layer protocol. So they split it in two, and I'll show you why that matters. Question, how does this relate to speedy protocol? It, this doesn't relate to speedy at all. Right. You could say that it's, it's, well, it relates to speedy in the same, in the way that Google introduced speedy and then it was taken to the ITF and the ITF said, let's standardize this and out came HP2, which was speedy uh, inspired and the same concept which turned into HP2. In this case, Quick was taken to the ITF by Google and the same uh, concepts and ideas are what is br being brought into this process. But a lot of the details and a lot of, basically everything has been changed since they brought it to the ITF. <clears throat> um, so, what do you do when you introduce a new transport protocol? I think you don't introduce transport protocols that often, so I think it's sort of a, it's a golden opportunity for everyone to just get on the bandwagon and bring your ideas. 
I think the group has had a little bit of a problem with that. A lot of strong wills and a lot of opinions. Let's fix this now. We've been suffering from blah, blah, blah since forever. This, I mean, TCP from the 1970s, right? They had some design things done wrong. We could change that. We can, for example, fix the TCP head of line blocking problem by doing a new transport protocol, by making sure that we can actually have many parallel streams at the same time and drop a packet in, in the middle and the other streams can go on. Um, we can fix the handshaking thing, right? We don't have to have three-way handshake and add TLS handshakes on top of that. We can actually have zero RTT handshakes or one RTT handshakes in quick. And we can fix that. I mentioned the TFO thing, which is the TCP fast open, which sends data already in the handshake, and we can fix that when we have that already from the beginning in the protocol. So we can actually, both of these are actually really strong emphasis for reducing latency in setting up new things and asking for data. And we can, of course, do more encryption, and we always do encryption. So there is no clear text version of Quick. There is only encrypted Quick. And the idea being there by doing everything encrypted always, basically exposing as little as possible to anything in between. I think there's a connection ID and there are some, there, the initial handshake packet is in clear text, but otherwise there are very few details to actually read from this. Is there any way for network operators to intercept the traffic in order for There is the no process. way for anyone to yeah. intercept the uh, traffic. Example, if you want to set a quality of service of different kind of data, uh, there is a lot of discussions <laughs> what operators want here or not. <laughs> and, <laughs> Going back to what we did with HTTP 2, that was also a, a lot of the discussion has always been, do we want HTTPS always or not? And then the operators come, yeah, but we want to monitor this and that. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's constant struggle. And uh, just to get into that a little bit, there's a, in the quick working group, there's a, as there was in the HTTP 2 working group, there's a lot of browser people there and the server people there, not so many operator people. So that means that there's pretty strong uh, security emphasis and encrypt everything. We don't care about the operators. But there's this little thing in the, in the quick header called the spin bit. And that's a lovely little bit you should read up on because I, that might be the bit in history that has had the longest discussions and most fierce <laughs> debates. Because that's a single bit in the quick a packet header that is supposed to be set by the client and the server for in every packet during one run trip and then altered. So you just switch it for every run trip <coughs> so that an operator can actually monitor a quick connection, the, the, um, the run trip time by measuring that bit. That's the idea that it's a sort of one, 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 zero, 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 zero. So you can measure all oh, there's a packet loss of stuff. So it's not that exact, but you can at least measure the run trip. But there's a, late, <laughs> there's a privacy leak there. And uh, yeah, the <laughs> I think it's going to be in the final spec now, that spin bit. But it also says in the, in the specification right now that each sender should ignore that bit in, I think, one-fifth of all connections, just to make sure that if you want to ignore the bit, it's not really notable for those. <laughs> And I know that some implementers have said that no, they would never implement a spin bit anyway. So there's, a, there's that. That's for one bit of uh, <laughs> exposing data to the operators. Uh, interesting types. So yeah, by encrypting everything, the hope is that we will have fewer things in between that can actually hamper things. So when we want to invent to do the quick version two in a few years, maybe, maybe there that'll be an easier ride and a smoother upgrade than ever before. I'm sure that there will be other reasons why it won't happen that easily, but anyway, not as many problems with the middle boxes at least. So this is built on top of UDP. So we we'll, we'll sort of leave TCP and UDP, they let them be, they are the protocols, we won't do anything with them, we just build stuff on top of it because your devices and all those middle boxes, they can speak UDP. So we just use UDP as if it was IP, basically. It's actually slightly more because you can 
get some features from the UDP feature in, in the stacks. But anyway, it's basically used like that. And then you then we build a, a reliable stack on top of UDP. And that reliable stack is basically TCP and TLS in one blob. That's quick. So just to iterate, since I get a lot of questions, when I mention UDP, everyone thinks, oh, but that's, that's uh, unreliable, right? Yes, it is. U UDP doesn't have connections, and you know there are no reasons, and there's no flow control. You just send a lot of data at night, and up there it might not. But of course, that's also still the case. But when you're doing quick, we use UDP like that. But then we add all the logic on top of that. If we lose a packet, we we send the packet. If, if we make sure that if there's too much of data, we don't send any more window, so that you you will handle the flow and everything. So it's an implementation, it's a TCP-like implementation on top of this. That is what QUIC is. And then QUIC introduces streams that are already in the transport protocol. If you're familiar with transport protocols, there's a protocol called SCTP, which introduced pretty much this 10, 15 years ago. So it's not a new thing. This is also a, available in the SSH protocol, and this is basically what HTTP2 has, HTTP2 then being an SSH being application protocol. So you pro we provide streams in the transport protocol, so they are just exactly as in HTTP2, many logical streams within a single connection, and then in the, in the transport latency we can get the benefit of for other application protocols. And they're independent. So that's really, we can send a lot of streams, and if we lose packets every here and there, we only lose those packets for those particular streams that they belong to. The other streams can continue. So the design is very carefully made here, so that packets are independent of each other in that regard. So only the lost packets are lost. We don't have to hand to the other streams. <coughs> Which is an interesting effect then, because when you take this into the HTTP land, you can actually send images from a server and they can end up in the client in the other order because of packet loss. And that introduces something new to think about. Uh, so the independent stream, then, just to get an image for this, with TCP, when we send many streams over the same connection, we send the green and the red one here, when we lose a link, when we lose a green one in the middle, the red one has to wait until the green link appears, and then everything can continue. But while, while we do it with quick, they truly appear to both ends as two different chains there. It doesn't matter if we lose a few blue to the, to the uh, yellow one. The yellow one will continue, as, and the blue one will continue when the blue links reappear. And that's done for the transport protocol, then we do application protocols on top of this. And the application protocol then, of course, gets the streams for free. We don't have to write application protocols to handle streaming because the streaming is already done by the transport protocol. Um, this could be any protocol. In the working group, it started out to, we should do this for more protocols than just HTTP. And DNS was mentioned frequently early on, but very early on, they also decided that mm, it would be too much to do more than pro one protocol at once, so let's focus everything on HTTP and do all the other protocols afterwards. So the focus is still HTTP first, but it's still separated, so there's still a transport protocol and there's an application protocol. Um, there will for sure be other protocols coming, but well, a little depending on how things go, but it will happen. So then one application protocol being HTTP and HTTP 3 then being the HTTP over QUIC. <coughs> but HTTP is again, HTTP remains the same, basically the same ideas. We do, we have this client here and we have a server there and we do requests. And requests are, they're unmodified in spirit. We do requests, or we have a method and path. You know, we have a get or a put or a post, and we have a path, and we send some headers in the request. We send some body sometimes, um, at least when we do put or post and stuff. And the server responds responds with a code and headers and body, and this remains the same. This has remained the same since 
1996. And for most users, this is what's interesting, right? They will see what happens on the wire. This, was, this will remain the same, this will continue, and we're all happy and we recognize it. Um, but underneath, of course, with HTTP 1, we did all the headers and stuff in pure text in ASCII over TCP. We added, we did everything in binary when we created HTTP 2, and then we multiplexed everything over HTTP, sorry, over TCP. And then with HTTP 3, we, did, we do everything in binary again, but this time the streams are done by quick. So, so HTTP became simpler, but the transport protocol became more complicated. To look at the HTTP 3 stack uh, from that more. Uh, this is the, how an HTTP 2 stack looks like, right? IP, TCP, TLS, and HTTP 2. Easy PC, we know this. Um, so when we do the same thing with HTTP 3, we do IP and we have UDP on top of that because we have to put a layer in between. And then we add quick there. And we use TLS 1.3 for all the encryption. And we do HTTP 3 over that. A lot of code here just appeared, the other ones. Um, when we did HTTP 2, that was really much easier because the other pieces were there already. They were quite big already existing. I mean, TCP and TLS, there were big chunks over there. There's no TCP, so we have to do everything in quick. <clears throat> and looking at the same sort of two versus three feature-wise, they're really similar feature-wise. HTTP 2 and HTTP 3 are not very different, other than them using different transport. They're different transports, they have streams, you can't, you can't do clear text versions of HTTP 3, but in practice you never do HTTP 2 in clear text anyway, over the internet, no browser supports it. You can do independent streams with HTTP 3, which should make them faster in bad connections. They have also, you probably don't see it further back, but the zero RTT handshake, you, you do, with HTTP 3 you will get much, uh, lower latency, so you will get data faster, especially on new connections and new streams. But otherwise, they're similar. They, they had to modify the header compression as well, so the header compression is actually not compatible completely between HTTP2 and HTTP3, and that's also because of the independent streams. So they're different, but they're quite similar feature-wise. So is this faster? It is hard to say what is faster here because, uh, as I said, this isn't, hasn't shipped yet, so we haven't gotten that many implementations yet to actually measure this on for real. But I took the liberty of looking at the numbers that Google has made, and Google made them on their version then of Quick, which isn't the same as the ITF Quick again, but I would imagine that we can see some similarities in numbers. So they, they could, like HTTP2, the biggest gains are, of course, in among those that have the worst conditions to begin with. I mean, if you're, if you're in the last 99 percentile of the internet connections, you're, you're probably in a really bad place to begin with. And those users, they could save a full second going to quick. And I don't know how much of a page load a full second is, but I guess it's not the full page load. I mean, that's the slowest 1% of the connections. And there's a lot of less buff, buffering and rebuffering on, on YouTube. I think a lot of this initial efforts on Quick was made to make YouTube better. Um, and it also they also proved that this um, feature to actually um, get the zero RTT handshakes is is a viable feature, so it's actually being used quite a lot, so it speeds up a lot of handshakes to get things earlier with Quick. And 3% on the mean page Google search load, 3%. I don't, it's not that much, but I guess in the grand scheme of things, 3% for everyone is at least a measurable impact. And again, this is, this is not for the current version of Quick and HTTP 3, so I'm, I'm looking forward to more measurements. Unfortunately, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. I, was, uh, I remember someone said that uh, 
TCP implementations today are much more well optimized, like the battery. Technology. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that too. But yes, TCP TCP stacks in general are much more optimized and enhanced better and more performant than the UDP version, which is kind of ironic, right? Since UDP is so much simpler, you would imagine that it would just be faster, but it's the opposite way, actually. So, and, and a lot of this, I mean, not only are the, uh, these are measurements done on the old Quake, so I'm sure that they will change. I also th think that we will, even after these protocols are done, the measurements will grow better because the UDP stacks will improve and there will be better uh, hardware offloading and stuff like that. So I think we have, um, it can still improve even afterwards. So how do we use Quick then? So, so this is Quick and this is how you do HP3 over Quick, but um, how do we kickstart a Quick connection from, from a client side to a server? HTTPS, that's TCP, right? As I mentioned, that's TCP with TLS on top over port 443 by default. And there are quite a few HTTPS full on slash slash URLs, right? We can't really change them. Actually, early on in the HTTP2 discussions, there was this discussion, should we actually mandate a different scheme in the URLs to it? <laughs> but I think quite, quite early on, the conclusion is no, we don't modify any URLs because HTTPS URLs, they're everywhere, literally, we can't change that. So we have to magically upgrade from HTTPS done over TCP and TLS over to Quake. And with HTTP2, that was easy. That was just a negotiation done in the TLS handshake. Which version do you speak? We can just switch to the other one. <clears throat> not as easily done with HTTP3, uh, since that's not the same transport protocol. So um, it remains like this. HTTPS colon slash slash, that is TLS over TCP. So if we haven't spoken to the server before, that's what we all we know. So we will continue to speak HTTP1 or HTTP2 to that server first. And then that server says, hey, I speak quick or HTTP3 really over here. Mission can be the same server. <coughs> anyway, and there's this nice header that actually existed even before we started with HTTP3. But it basically says, I, I run this service an identical service like this on this port, host, and protocol, which could be the same host and another port or another server or whatever, for this number of seconds into the future, which ideally then is not seconds, but weeks or months or whatever. So your favorite server that you go to, HTTPS colon slash slash example.com, it will respond with this alt service and say, I speak HTTP 3 over here for the next year. And for the next year, we will keep that information cached, so we will always speak HTTP 3 to that other server for example.com. That's the idea. I'm sure that there will be other uh, ways to do this in the future when people are going to try to, why not just try uh, quick or HTTP 3 as well. Um, I know that there have, have been already been experiments with this. I, um, Facebook has done a lot of HTTP3 deployments, at least internally, and they have worked a lot with how to figure out when to use HTTP3 or not early on. Does this mean that after a year you will fall back to TCP? Really? Yeah, exactly. Well, after a year, yeah. When this times out, yeah. the, the old service header times out, then you switch it, back to the to the original. Can update the time through quick operation. Uh, you mean if you can keep sending the old service header over the quick header? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think you should be able to. Then you would never have to right. No, you're right. You don't have to fall back. You can just extend it or, or put point to another header. This header was made for, for HTTP2 originally, since HTTP2 made you get stuck on a single connection virtually forever, right? Since you, get, you only use one connection. So it's basically made to help you transition over to another connection because this might go away. Do you know how Chrome does it? Chrome does it exactly like this. For, for Google for, Quick. For Google yeah. Quick. So, so they have, um, if, you just, if you just monitor what Chrome sends, it will uh, get, if you're using Chrome on a Google service, which some people do <laughs> occasionally, you will see this response happen. It says, uh, 
and it says, I, I told you, and it uses quick as a term, and it uses quick on this port, blah, 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 something. Uh, I think it's the six as well, the port. It, yeah, it might be, yes. The port, yeah. The, the fixed port, yeah. But it still uses that method. Actually, not even Chrome knows that Google speaks quick on these ports, even if I guess it could. Yeah. Some question over there? Yeah, mine was the same about the default port. Right. Yeah, I think they're talking about the default port here, and it's 443 over UDP. Yeah, but I'm not sure it matters very much. It's, it matters when you want to race both against each other because if you don't know. But if you're going to use the old service, it doesn't matter if you have a default port or not because you could just as well just send the port in the response header as well. Uh, was it some kind of trade-off for making decisions? What were other options? The trade, well, the, the, since, yeah, there have been a lot of discussions on how to do this. And I don't think the final word has been said yet either because this, this going to the TCP version first, it also makes you get stuck in time, right? Because what happens in the post-TCP world when we don't want to speak TCP ever again? But what happens to that? That we sort of how do you how do you kickstart this if you have no TCP implementation in your client? So I, I don't think the final word has been said, and I, that's why I also think that there will be more than one way to figure this out. And I'm sure that there will be these happy eyeballs races also. Why not just try both and get the one that answers fastest? So it will happen. This is the documented way of doing it. Uh, as I understand, this is just like Google made some hack to try the new protocol with Chrome, and this is just stuck in, in the standard now. Well, well, this wasn't created for this. This was created already before that. We, we, as I said, it was more of a hint that hey, if you're if you don't like your connection over here, we're also over here. It was actually a help to increase load balancing when doing HTTP two. But that's a sort of a little parenthesis. But back in the day when we only did HTTP one dot one, and as I said, we only do one request, right, and close the connection. Basically, if you have X number of load balancers, you can be fairly sure that they're so short-lived they will just get sprinkled all over all the time because they will die really soon. But introducing HTTP 2, you might get stuck with a long-going connection, and then by accident you might actually have all the connections on one of your load balancers and none on the others. And they will not go away because they're designed to get stuck there. And that's why this was introduced, so you could sort of hint your client, maybe you should try one of my other load balancers over here. So it just turned out to be a very fancy way to, you can just as well hint about the other protocol as well. Why not? So that was the um, things that HP3 has and uh, will provide. But HTTP3 has some interesting challenges that we never had with HTTP2 and which I think will make some um, road bumps onto this. First we have this, well this is UDP and what do we do with UDP in our enterprise? We block it, right? Nobody does anything sensible with UDP. So measuring how many connections that actually never get established the number of failures is around three to seven percent, depending on who measures, what you measure, and, and who says what. But that's quite a large number, right? So all the implementations here are going to do a very heavy fallback. Or again, back to these old service headers, you pretty much have to do that because you don't know how your quick connection is going to do. Will it succeed or not? Seven percent, that's quite a lot of connections that never will appear. So going forward to start with, we will have a lot of falling back or never switching to HTTP 3, which of course adds a lot of code. I mentioned before that UDP is slightly slower in most Linux implementations. There are actually some good patches on UDP going right now, but you know, kernel movements in your servers, it's going to take a while until people have fast UDP implementations. And Quick is really CPU intensive. They're talking about basically two to three times the CPU for usage for the same bandwidth, which of course is going to be a significant um, number to those running servers if you have 
a lot of connections, there's going to be a lot of CPU use, at least initially, which goes back to implementations of UDP stacks, TCP stacks, and the uh, lack of TCP, oh sorry, uh, offloading to hardware. So if the SSL encryption here is done completely different than this for TCP. And uh, uh, <coughs> that's the funny TLS layer. You know, TCP, when they made TLS, that's made the sort of design to do, be done over TL, uh, TLS is pretty much designed to be done over TCP. So they send TCP records, no, sorry, they send TLS records over TCP. That's how you do it. But when you do a new transport protocol with embedded TLS, they decided that TLS records, that's not the way to do it. We should just use the messages, the TLS messages that they actually send within those records. Um, the only little uh, drawback there is that no existing TLS library had APIs for that. <laughs> that little subtle detail, like OpenSSL, for example. Uh, so they don't have, you can't really ex use one of the existing Nowadays, some of them have. Boring SSL, NSS, has, uh, some of the other uh, smaller TLS libraries now have APIs for this, but uh, some of the others don't, like Secure Transport S Channel or OpenSSL or LibreSSL uh, and some others. They don't have these. So they have an API problem, and also then it introduces this uh, when we're using different TLS, uh, we can't offload it to hardware the way we do for TCP. I'm sure the offloading will enhance over time when more manufacturers and this gets stabilized and people actually can earn money on making it. So I'm sure it'll improve over time, but it's still a challenge short term. <clears throat> There's an interesting challenge that all quick stacks here are done user land, right? So there are nothing, there, there won't be any quick in kernel, kernels, I would imagine for a long time. Not only because it's a huge chunk of code, and kernels move really slow, and, and this is a, well, not only a huge chunk of TCP-like code, there's also you know, the entire TLS in here and everything, so it's, and it's being developed and moving fairly fast. So I think we're going to see, look forward to quick implementations done as libraries in user space for a long time. So what about reference implementations? Is there a, who, who's, who's making yeah. reference implementations? Yes, there are 15 of them, <laughs> or 21. <laughs> yes. So. And that's also another challenge here. Yeah, there are a lot of different, I'll mention a few, but there are a lot of different ones and they have no standard API, which is also, I think, a little bit of a hurdle here because if, you're, if you want to start doing this now, a bit early, I want to. They don't have a standard API. So this, yeah, there are 15 of them. They have 15 different APIs. So sure, you can do that, but you have to get married to one of them or, well, it's a lot of work if you're not picking one of them. I picked two. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, th th and I think that's a, that's a problem or a challenge. So what you're saying that within the HTTP three standard, there's no consensus on should it contain the API definition as well? The, no, no the, this, the the working group doesn't work with the API at all. The working group defines the bytes over the wire. So that's the only thing they work on. So there's no there's not even any discussions about APIs. I, I guess there might come a discussion about that going forward, but I think right now the, the working group is so f fully occupied with this, so it's not going to happen before the protocol ships. And they're all, all these um, parties that are working in the working group, basically all of them already have their own implementations, so I guess they all also get stuck and married into their own designs and APIs, so it's going to be really challenging too to afterwards say, hey, we should make a standardized API, which one? So I think it would be a good idea, but I, I, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take a long time. Because you think moving uh, the, the stack uptake and use system is going to have a lot of like, the issues if we continue to do like uh, the traffic management in, in user lab, meaning a lot of content switching to the kernel. And uh, do, uh, I don't think adding it to user land adds latency in general, no. Because I think you're going back and forth so much anyway, since we're talking HTTP stuff, so you have, it's back and forth anyway. So I think it's 
basically the same number of transitions back and forth to the kernels. I don't think it adds latency. I think it adds a lot of other things, like suddenly you're, you have many different applications with different versions of your quick library. And having, I, I'm, what I get concerns from people immediately when, when I mention this use that, oh, but adding a new transport layer, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the challenges when you're doing new transports on the internet is to be fair with existing connections, right? So if, if you open two TCP connections and you open a third quick connection and they all download data as fast as possible, they're supposed to be fair. And that's what people have been working on for a long time. They should be fair. You shouldn't starve out the others just because you're using one quick and the others are using TCP. Well, roughly fair for whatever meaning that is. But if you're using it, useland is much easier for you to just, mm, I don't need to be that fair, right? My application is slightly more important than the others. I'll just tweak these little parameters that aren't in any API anywhere, but I can just rebuild and go for it. It's hard also to synchronize between processes by having the same message. If you're trying to be fair, not like us to send them. Right, you can, you can only be fair within the connections for your, exactly, so you can't, you can't make it see. You can do designs for the entire system because every stack is uh, sort of isolated in the realm application. Isn't that true for network layer as well? That the UDP traffic will take uh, priority over the TCP traffic and the, the TCP, uh, because network doesn't actually, there is no actual control over the UDP traffic in the network. Uh, yes, uh, the fact that it is U UDP introduces challenges for everyone who manages networks. In, to put it short. <laughs> <laughs> and then another challenge is, of course, you know, there's not that many tools around to actually, you know, monitor this, debug this, back to the operator questions, how do you monitor this quality, and, and even just debugging, right? What, what, happen, what happens with all those Windows updates and sequence numbers you learned in TCP school since decades? They're not there, right? and they're all encrypted since the first packet. So, you have to have tools really to just to decrypt everything. And to decrypt everything, it's another challenge because they've added new secrets or they're using things from TCP layer differently. So you can't just export t secrets from the TLS layer like you did before. So even that little simple thing that you did before with the SSL keylog thing and you ran Wireshark, you could inspect, you can inspect like Firefox, Chrome, and curl traffic. That also introduces new things you have to export more secrets. Yeah, so another challenge that might not be TCP suite specific is like the zero round trip thing. You can replay that. Thing. Yes, the zero round the zero round trip handshake has a, a replay or a replay sort of vulner. You have to be aware that you can replay the same thing. Yes. But th that actually already exists with TCP and, TL and, and TLS and in HTTP. So it actually doesn't introduce anything. It might emphasize it, but it's not. It's actually not a new thing. Going back to uh, to quick being implemented in use land, is that only a challenge, or could it be something positive as well? You know, I would say that in, so far it has certainly been one of the reasons why we're doing this. So I, uh, it's, it's now it's a challenge. I would say that it's sort of the foundation of being able to do this to start with. Since now we, we could reiterate, I mean, Google has done what, like 40 iterations of the protocol over the years. So it's very easily done like this. If they'd done it in kernel space, we would be on the first iteration and we're waiting for the first still. So no, I would say that was one of the criteria that, that made it possible to begin with. It's only now when, things are stabilizing that it might become a problem or a challenge. I mean, then there's actually nothing that prevents anyone from putting this in a kernel. The design, as I said, the, the, the specification here is on the protocol over the wire. You can just as well do this in a kernel if you want to. I just think, don't think it'll happen anytime soon. Do you know anything about Google's like, server implementation? I guess in MDFK we are doing the SQL termination in like hardware and how would you transfer that like hardware termination into a encryptionless uh, back backstab? Um, well, I will. How they do the termination? If you looked at my brand slides from the beginning, they're all big players. They're all running huge server farms and a lot of machines. So I think they all have this problem how to do a lot of connections. But I. I so I, but I don't, I don't have any insights, any particular insights on how they run their servers to handle this. 
but I would imagine also that a lot of these servers, or at least if you're an early adopter of this, you would convert it at the ed edge, right, and use one of the older trusty protocols internally. Also because this is a latency focused and it's focused on things that are better on the, on the wider scale and within your data center it might not matter, you're in on your microseconds level anyway. So going back to you, Sylvain, again, uh, uh, you made this talk about quick and then you said in a few years you might have quick too. Yes. So is, is that the way that you that you see the protocol development? That it would be like a yearly release cycle? I don't. I, I'm I'm convinced that the version quick version two is going to the work on that is going to be started almost immediately after version one has been shipped, because there's so much interest and there's so many issues in GitHub marked <laughs> postponed, basically. So there's this wall of issues just waiting for people to dig into. So I'm sure that V2 will be started really soon. But exactly how soon and when that will convert into an actual protocol called version 2, I don't know, because who knows what happens. I also think it matters then how well this fares, right? If nobody deploys this, then V2 won't happen. But if this goes fairly well, V2 will happen sooner. And I think this is SP2 put a lot of foundations in place to make sure that we can iterate faster on HTTP2 in the future, and this is certainly the proof, proof that it actually is like that, right? It's 2015, and we're talking now 2019. It's not even four years since the last spec, and we're talking about shipping this, this year. So I'm certain that V2 will also, they will try, they will try to have it out within years, maybe less than four, maybe not, I don't know. So, so having like a small iterative release because of uh, months, like we, we improved the protocol slightly and now we can implement it everywhere. That's, that's not going to happen. It's, it's going to be years and... Yes, I, and that goes back to another f philosophy in, in protocol design. Really that everyone here, and I think that started already Actually, within protocol design, it started a long time ago, but it was uh, tried out already in HTTP2 that we're trying to make protocols with as few optional things as possible. Because optional things means that a few people will implement that, and then three years later, nobody can implement it because it's not interoperable. So we try to make things always on. You don't switch anything off in the protocol. That means also that's also the reason why we don't try to you know, add a few things, because we have everything always on. Uh, and I think that is a reason why we don't try to just add a little option to tweak this and make a 3.1 in, in 12 months. That won't happen. <coughs> so it, it'll be HP3 now, and it, if we do something else, it'll be HP4 going forward to just make sure that all options are enabled. I guess you're in the toolkit of quick development of, of quick and HTTP. As you, they were dependent on each one. In the general blob, you said that application and transport was dependent on each one. Yeah, right, but, but exactly right. The, the HTTP is truly a, a, an application protocol on top of Quick. So they actually not, they don't have to be developed by the same team at, at all. I think, I think it, it was good in this case because the actual sort of the, the layer between the glue layer that it wasn't really the, set up from the beginning, so it's been a back and forth. Where do we do things? You know, like uh, flow control. Is the flow control supposed to be in the application layer or in the transport layer? And, and, and things like that. So I think it was good that it, it was the same team here. But I think going forward, when, when Quick becomes an established transport protocol, when we're talking other application protocols done on top of that, it will, I mean, there's no necessity for the, for this, for the Quick team to be involved in that. You could do DNS over Quick tomorrow, right, without involving them. Just use the mechanics from, from Quick, or invent your own protocol done over Quick. It's, it's going to be easy, but uh, I mean doable. And a lot of the HTTP stuff is now being worked, uh, transferred from the Quick working group in the ITF over to the HTTP BIS working group within the ITF. So it is being transferred over to the HTTP people from the Quick people. How dependent HTTP, HTTP <coughs> HTTP 3 is really dependent on Quick. 
I'm sure that you can actually change. I mean, HTTP 2 and HTTP 1 is really made for TLS also. So, it, I mean, it is possible to change the transport, but HTTP 3 is really designed for Quake. In particular, for example, it is designed to handle these independent streams, for example. So, it, that's why it differs so much from HTTP 2 because the transport is different. Does, does application, this operating on which HTTPS application protocol has to uh, use some extra data channels between data, uh, transport protocol and uh, application protocol. Like, are you, do you have to be aware of like some channel information and things like that? You mean if you're you're free implementing an application over HTTP? Yeah. Uh, over over no over over quick. If you do it over quick, um, I I think I think that's. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that in a good way right now because I haven't worked a lot with this myself yet. But I'm sure that if you, since you want to use Quick to the best of your ability, you'd have to be aware that it's Quick there, right? So you can make sure that you get your your zero RTT handshakes and you can actually use the streams over there. So you you have to be pretty transport aware to make sure that you're actually using the transport in, in the best possible way. Are we cool. stuck forever with UDP? Sorry, are yeah. we stuck with UDP forever now? Well, yes, we are stuck with UDP. So, so uh, <laughs> that's a good question because I mean, a lot of a lot of talk in the IETF is about the post-TCP world. That means go away from TCP into something different. The different, the only viable change is quick. But UDP is not mentioned as there's no post-UDP world. It's more like only UDP. But the UDP is so simple, so there's really nothing to get rid of there. But do you consider like the network stack so slow, uh, the network technology uh, is so s developing so slow that you have to like pinpoint the, the old protocol now and do not rely on any like new network stack parts at all? Well, the quick is a way to make sure that you don't rely on anything. I mean, like an SCP experience. Teach us that it's impossible to SCTP yeah. taught us really that yeah you don't introduce a new protocol on this level because nobody will talk to you and I mean SCTP doesn't even work through a NAT it doesn't it doesn't have a good TLS story and there's a there's a great RFC or, or internet draft actually written by some guys who actually compared couldn't we do a quick uh, with SCTP over UDP like they did with WebRTC like it's been done before. But uh, SCTP actually has some several other downsides that made it not a suitable replacement for this either. So SCTP is basically stuck in telecom land forever because they're using it. Um, and to get some speed up in UDP, it's like the end, the clients and the servers and the closest middle boxes, because at the core of the internet doesn't care about UDP, it's like Exactly, yeah. So, so the UDP problems or, or sort of the lack of speed problem in UDP stacks, I think, are primarily in the servers. So I think that that's where, because in the client side, you're, I mean, when you're using your browser, you're usually not CPU bound or anything like that anyway, so it doesn't matter if it's not ideal. I'm, uh, I'm thinking about the classic, like, well, if you load a site over the HTTP 3 or HTTP 2, would there be less traffic on the wire as there's no handshakes and... Yes, and uh, I, I mean, yeah, I guess there could be if you're doing a little bit of a handshake, but in, in a regular case, I would imagine that the, the payload data is the huge bulk here, so I, I don't think there's going to be a notable bandwidth difference. I mean, I mean, tiny bits here and there, but I don't think, on the, on the grand scale, I don't think you'll notice any difference there. And they're all TLS encrypted, they're all compressed. I mean, the compression doesn't change really much. There's a different header compression, but all the HTTP data is going to be compressed the same way. And so I, I think it's going to be roughly the same bandwidth. But it's also to get less overhead, you should have Larger MTUs and less also network thing. So yes, and and it, and and um, playing with MTU, that's no, no, no. Uh, that's not going to uh, help Quick anyway, because Quick is going to make 
been made basically to assume that a lot of MTU problems. Uh, but, but yeah, sure. But if you get 9K to, the, to your end computer, like the core of the internet is 9K or some even bigger sometimes? So. Yes, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so there, there is this path MTU discovery mechanism here as well. So yeah, it might. But again, going from what, 1500 to 9K? And yeah, you so you're removing the short header from three out of four packets. That's gaining what? Twelve bytes, the twenty thirty-six bytes from nine k. I, I I don't think. That <laughs> sure, you you gain some data, but I don't think from, from the from big picture you wouldn't really care about that. Uh, and there's the ship date, the July twenty nineteen. That's what the schedule for the um, working group says that the, the RFCs will be published. There are five documents, I believe. And it has been postponed before, so I'm, I'm not saying that it will actually happen this day, but this is what it says right now. And that's interesting because implementation wise, there aren't that many in the wild. There are a lot of quick implementations. Uh, I would say actually surprisingly many. I think there are like 15 or maybe a bit more. And uh, there are not that many HTTP3 implementations. I think primarily because HTTP3 has been more or less the last part of the protocol uh, drafts here that were worked on. So it, it, they haven't really established HTTP3 until pr pretty much maybe six months ago. So when it started to become fairly reliable. and. Here are some of the ones that are in doing quick implementations. Pretty much all the browsers and the big HP uh, server side players. <clears throat> there are no browser implementation of this yet, which I think says something, because when we were at this point in HTTP2 development, I think most of the browsers and those interesting on the client side, they all have, we all had implementations in place and we could interoperate and play around and even if we went there spec wise we had implementations to play with and we don't now which i think is a bit alarming and might hint that we might not ship in july i don't know or they might ship soon uh, i don't uh, right under the big servers or the biggest open source ones they don't have implementations either so we're far off Carl doesn't speak hp3 either yet <laughs> I'm a lazy person. Uh, no, I'm, um, I actually have done HTTP 1 requests over quick with curl. <laughs> Bec because HTTP 3 is not really there. So yeah, I'm working, with, I'm working on quick implementations and I'm working with HTTP 3 and I, I'm actually right now working with two different quick libraries. Um, because why not? No, because the, there are different conditions and they're good people and why not? So I, I'm hoping to have a, something HP3 within months, maybe, still depending on those libraries and what time we get. What libraries are you using? I'm using NGTCP2, which is a mouthful, and, uh, and the, the Quiche library, as, in, <laughs> as a little than subtitle yes good fun with a lot of puns with when the name is quick right so quiche is quick in the name right and mgtcp2 is named after one of the uh, creators of the protocol of quick which famously didn't like to call it tcp2 so now it's in the library name <coughs> <laughs> but but neither of those actually implement hp3 yet so they right. implement quick so um, my focus right now is to make sure that curl can actually make a quick connection to whatever server and to make com matters even more complicated then i also have to do this alt service parser so i can get an alt service response first and then go back to hp3 which i haven't either but uh, going forward i hope to uh, <coughs> Um, there are there are several tricky parts. First, the NGTCP2 library. They, I I I think they have this great goal of making sure that it would be TLS library independent. Yay! But that means, yeah, you handle the TLS library parts. So that 
adds a lot of code on me to get that glue thing. Oh, I have to extract the secrets and uh, use those things. So that made it really complicated to write the quick parts for NGTCP2 because I, I mean I don't really follow exactly the details about this. I mean, so it turns out to be a lot of code. And then the other library that Kish, they made it depend on Boring SSL, which made it easy for them because Boring SSL has these APIs that OpenSSL doesn't. But then it made me, oh, but then if you link with Boring SSL for the quick library, how do I do with SSL for everything else in curl, which is usually not Boring SSL. So right now, I, I really haven't solved that. So just if you, you want to use Quiche, you use Boring SSL now. Even if you use NGTCP2, you have to use his patched version of OpenSSL that actually has the APIs necessary, uh, which, is, which is even worse situation because that's not even uh, an official one. It's just his, his local tree, basically. So uh, I would say the TLS situation is really the most complicating part here. And uh, yeah, and that the fact that there's not a lot of this uh, HP three library in place either. So I'm, I'm I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to proceed with HP three when I get there in a f in a few weeks. <coughs> so um, problematic, yes. So related to the no standard quick API, like how is the TLS API standard? Is, is that TLS good? libraries or TLS APIs are not standard either. They're crazier than, than you can imagine. <laughs> but, I mean, the TLS situation is basically that OpenSSL is so dominant that everyone is mimicking OpenSSL. OpenSSL, if anyone sees this recording, it, it has a really horrible API and it's really <laughs> crappily documented. So it's basically, you never, never, you never really know if you're right or wrong until it just works, and then you never change it. And all the other libraries, they just mimic that as far as possible. So, so if you're using OpenS, no, sorry, if you're using BoringSL or LibreSSL, I mean they're op uh, OpenSL forks, right? So they have the same API. So that's easy. They just, they basically just, um, have modified a few things. So when they add the, these APIs for for Quick, they have just added a few functions. So we just have to, if that's boring, we can use those functions. So that is the easy part. But if you're looking into the other uh, TLS libraries, then you're really in the same dilemmas. They're all different. So uh, supporting a lot of TLS libraries, then that is crazy because everything has to be done from the beginning for all of these libraries, mm -hmm. apart for those the, the, those who are forks. So we have nine different files, basically, for those 12 different TLS libraries that we support. That's a lot of work. <coughs> So I think it'll take some time until we'll see HP3 deployed out in the big world because of these challenges. I don't want to say problems because I, do, I think we'll overcome them. There are truly challenges. So it's, I think it's beyond doubt that it will take longer time than HP2 did. I mean, HP2, when that spec shipped, all browsers shipped their, I think it was even in release versions, basically pretty much the same month that it shipped. Here, we don't even have a browser that ships it even in no developer version, no beta version. No way that they will ship a release version in July with HTTP 3. <clears throat> and then back when we, I blogged about this yesterday, back when HTTP 2 shipped, we had this problem with SSL as well because HTTP 2 introduced, we negotiate HTTP 1 or HTTP 2 using a TLS extension called ALPM, if you remember this little fun thing. And when we shipped HTTP 2, the, the current OpenSSL versions didn't support that extension because we were all using older uh, OpenSSL versions. But the latest <coughs> OpenSSL version did support it. And that was a big problem already then because people were using the old version, not the new version. That was a big problem. Today, we don't even have an OpenSSL version, not even in Git that supports this. So I think that will be a problem. So I think uh, going back also to some of the other, I think lovely word grab, only the two that you like. But uh, I think going forward also with the problems with a lot of CPU spent for the same effort, pretty much for the same service of a quick makes it, if you're using a server, if you're running a server here, you're going to spend a lot of CPU. And what's the gain for your users, right? 3%. 
maybe twice the CPU for 3%, it's not what you want to do. Maybe, I mean, of course you're going to measure your traffic and your users, but maybe if it's that, it's not going to be in favor of HTTP3. So I think some sites definitely will just say, maybe it's not worth it. Of course, I'm convinced that the big ones, I'm sure that Google and Facebook and a few others, they are going to write as soon as they can. But all those who are involved in Quick, they're looking at this on the long term. We're talking Quick as a transport protocol, replacing TCP long term. So it doesn't really matter if it takes three years to get some users. We're talking decades ahead here. So it doesn't matter that much, even if I'm a bit pessimistic about the short term. And then looking forward, after Quick ships then in July, and they have stick to the schedule, all those issues I mentioned in GitHub, that says after V1, one of them says multipath, right? That's, that's the feature from the TCP people tend to talk about at least. Uh, forward error correction, waste bandwidth by doing fewer retransmits and uh, unreliable streams. Why not introduce unreliable streams within Quick? <laughs> like UDP. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually, so sort of, yeah, if you're going to do DNS, UDP-like over quick. Maybe it should be done with unreliable streams. Or maybe if you're doing a game that you're already using unreliable and reliable today, maybe you want to mix them, why not do them over quick? But secure video streaming. Yeah. Right. Yes, so, so there are, actually, I'm, I'm joking, but there are good <laughs> use cases. <laughs> not for HTTP, but I mean, you, a lot of people are actually using un unreliable streams today. So if you're going to do new transport, maybe you want to support more use cases. And there are, of course, going to be more application protocols done over Quick going forward. Hopefully, then not in the same working group, because when the, once this becomes an established transport protocol, basically anyone can write protocols on, on top of it. Okay, so if you were asleep in the beginning or in the middle, and I wanted that HTTP comes soon, it's always encrypted. It is very similar to HTTP 2. Feature wise, as a user of HTTP, um, it's going to be look like the same. Uh, but it's going to be quick instead of TCP. We're talking uh, some fun challenges to overcome, at least initially. And uh, live before summer 2019, e, let's see. <laughs> maybe, well, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. Uh, <clears throat> I wrote all the, what I said today in a little document that you can read on that URL if you want to. Uh, I just crossed 1,000 GitHub stores today, actually. Uh, so, any questions? It was crystal clear, but we had a lot of questions in between, so I guess we took most of them. Is it hard to get HTTP3? Uh, would you have this uh, in reliable streams and stuff like that? Would you get that gaming thing? So, YouTube or video streaming, will you get using Quick before the web does it? No, because I mean, no, there, since this is HTTP3, the HTTP3 is the only protocol standardized to use Quick. So um, there's really, sure, you can use Quick without using a standard protocol. Since, I mean, sorry? <laughs> right, yeah, that's a good pun. No, but uh, so I don't think anything else will get there faster in a standard capacity, but. If you're reading on one of these mailing lists, especially the mailing list that Google set up for Quick, you, you quickly learn that there are a lot of game developers, for example. They're very interested in these low latency uh, things. So there are already a lot of games done with the Google Quick approach. And I know some of the Google apps are already using Google Quick for their data transfer. So I know that there is a, a big interest. but. Neither of those, or none of those, are using the standard IETF quick for this. As far as I know. Oh, a lot of questions. Is this very nice with the other standards like IPv6 and the RTP? Uh, if it plays with other standards, it plays very well with IPv6, as it's rather agnostic to it. It's actually not agnostic because there are different characteristics, but yeah, it it's certainly done with full awareness or knowledge and uh, done to work with IPv6. WebRTC is a completely different thing. So WebRTC is not going to be, it's not part of Quick in any way really right now. 
I think, I mean, that's another one of those application protocols that can be made to be done over quick. And possibly one of those that could take most of the advantages of it since it's, it's a stream-based protocol already. So maybe. Countries like uh, uh, with the Big Brother mentality, like China, um, do they going to be if, able to implement? If China is going to support it or implement it, well, I don't know. I I don't know how they handle HTTPS in general today. I guess it's the same issue for them if they want to if they want to mon monitor their population. How do they handle that? I guess uh, so, so. I don't think it changes that a lot since I, since if you want to interfere with HTTPS traffic for real if you want to monitor your users you you use a ca or something to to prevent uh, to insert a middleman in the traffic and i guess you would do the same thing then to i mean quick is not designed in any way to be get mon to become monitored like that so you have to sort of misbehave pretty badly to do that but i guess some I guess timing it. Right, so yeah, I think, I mean, quick is, is harder, you get less out of a quick connection than you get out of, out of a TCP TLS connection in general, since more data is, is encrypted, and, and as, as you said, with streams on top of it. But if you're doing HTTP2, you do a lot of streams over it, so, it, so it's hard to measure. But uh, I, I don't know. I'm sure that people are researching that, and we will learn about more details. My imagination is too crappy to come up with. What is your forecast on implementation? Will there be how, how long there will be in uh, compatibility with hell? I mean, even with TCP, we have like a roughly small amount of implementations that are quite stable. There are still problems with compatibility. <laughs> yeah, well, in compatibilities, I guess. Um, yeah, what do I foresee? I don't know. I mean, ideally, uh, right now, I would say that the the development of the protocols have been very focused on, in, on interop between the different implementers. And since we have a lot of implementers, I think it has made it, the work has been really good then, so that with, if you have 10 implementations and they all roughly interoperate, that's a good quality assurance for the product, for the spec and vice versa. Then. So I think right now it's in, it's in a pretty good situation. But again, I, I, I don't know. Putting a full you know, TCP-like, TLS like protocol like this to a user to implement. I guess there are a lot of rooms to mess up and misbehave security problems. Just every other bit is wrong somehow. So I guess there will be some challenging ahead to, to make sure that the library you select for your application is going to be as good as possible with all the others. But when, when it gets stable, how, how, who will be the players on the implementation? Because now, like, but if I if I'm going to make guesses on what any players will do, since I'm not employed by any of them, can I just sit here and make guesses? So I don't. I mean, traditionally, Google is not the one who makes anything for anyone else, right? Have, have you seen the HP2 stack or TLS stack or anything? They don't do anything for the others. I mean, boring SSL, they actually do, but they basically say to everyone, "Don't use this in your application." <laughs> it's literally what they say. So. I don't think Google is the one who's going to make any standard uh, implementation or reference implementation for everyone. The, if there's going to be any reference implementation or an implementation that actually becomes a de facto implementation, that's going to be one of the others. Um, and looking at uh, the development right now, which I'm not sure is a good way to look at it, because who knows what will change in six months, but none of the browsers are very forward in this. The ones with the implementations right now are like the NGTCP2, which is an independent implementation, and then there are a lot of these um, CDN implementers. So I, I think one of the, those, they're all open source, they're all there, so we can all run them and just pick the one we like best. And I think one of those, or some of those are going to be the ones that win in the long run. That's a rough guess, and it's so early, so it's, I could just as well be wrong. Yeah, uh, you talked a lot about you not liking middle boxes. Will there still uh, 
it will kill proxies in the way that I mean HPS already killed proxies uh, in the in the local side. So yes, proxies are really not in the quick architecture. You, you, you still do connect, will you be able to do something similar? Yes, you can still do connect. Uh, <laughs> well, you do connect. The, the connect thing is over HTTP. So it's HP3 has a connect, right? So you can do connect, but that's, so you get a stream over quick, over HTTP, so then you can tell all your TCP, I guess. So, so <laughs> but when you're talking about proxies, do you mean proxies in like your corporate network onto the internet, or do you talk about reverse proxies? Yeah, I was talking, I was talking local proxies, sort of the, the, um, not the reverse proxies in the other end. Because I mean, if you're using true end-to-end -end encryption, there's no there's no proxy in between. But of course, it, what you terminate your traffic with in the server side, that is, I mean, that's a server from my perspective. But that might actually be a proxy into your server network. I don't know. And that will of course work pretty much the same way as it is today. Do you see Quick having an effect? On hardware design, if it's drawing so much more CPU, I'm thinking mobile devices, battery powered devices. In general. I'm 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 pretty sure that it will have an effect on hardware, and just by the fact that, as I mentioned, the hardware offloading that they want to do with with Quick. So, if hardware can assist the, this encryption part, I I think they are going to make it better. So if uh, maybe that's hand in hand too. So maybe if Quick becomes successful and you really want to do a lot of quick then that might drive the hardware development and vice versa because if, if nobody's using quick maybe it's not such a big deal if you waste a little cpu here and there so i think it's a, time will tell but i think this, it will definitely drive there will be hardware offloading companies doing things for the server side definitely because if you have your server farms and you want to go quick you you want to offload stuff from your cpu so some, it will have some effect. I don't know how big. You, you mentioned DNS before, but that work is basically sleeping now. Yes, basically all other protocols in HTTP is asleep, basically. Postpone, don't bother us about this until we're done with this. So, so I think once it, a quick version one is, when people sort of say, ah, oh, we're done, then people are going to flock from all, all over with all these different things that they want to do after quick v1 did you hear anything more than dns i no i can't say that i heard anything more than dns i think people have brought up different things but i haven't really paid attention and i don't think none of them have really caught on because the the mantra has been all the time no no let's not do this now we focus on this and try to stay focused so that we can actually deliver something on time instead of give, getting lost in, in the rat holes of different protocols. So I think I think there will be others, I'm, I'm quite sure. Is the quick stack implementation on DOS? <laughs> quick stack implementation on DOS? Well, I'm pretty sure that yeah. <laughs> The curve will support it soon. <laughs> well, when uh, this is really nothing about HTTP three, but when I did my last release for curl, seven dot sixty three dot three libraries, they really made. I mean, these open source style, really portable libraries. So I'm sure they will be compilable on on whatever systems we like, and I'm sure a lot of us will. At least try to. So it, it surprised me a bit that no browser currently supports HTTP three, or that you are at the same stage as you were for HTTP two. Is there any particular reason for this? Um, I don't think that. I mean, the reason, from my perspective, is just the, the immensely much bigger complexity in the, the challenge here in writing the code here. It's much more code, and, and um, that's really the only explanation I have. I, I mean, I know someone who worked with Firefox recently, but uh, and there it was really a question of manpower. So it's, it's a lot of work, and, and the 
protocol has changed a lot over time, so they have really not been very... Uh, a lot of the times you've had to more or less start over with the interrupt test because they changed some fundamental parts of the protocol, so it's been a lot of, oh, let's start over this part, so a lot of moving things in the, in the spec. But it will come there eventually. Shouldn't the reason be that Speedy was really close to HTTP2? So people have Speedy implementations already and therefore should do HTTP2 instead? Uh, well, right, but but yeah, we, people could do it. a lot of uh, in in the browser side. People did speedy, and then they did HTTP two because that yeah. they were really close. Yeah. Right now, they can go the and I think from from the perspective that I come from, a lot of us who went into quick and HTTP three, we thought we we ignore the Google version and we focus on going with the, the ITF version. Yes, so we never really got to the Google one. So we haven't done that transition. We just went directly to the ITF one, and that is the first implementation. So I, I, that is one explanation, yeah. Uh, on the stakeholders, the big companies you showed in the beginning, it sounds like they're more interested in quick than HTTP. Is it, was it that? Uh, no, uh, no, I don't think so, because all these are HTTP I mean, agents. They're all, they're all doing their primary traffic over HTTP. So I think HTTP 3 is there. Uh, I would per perhaps voice it the other way around. I think all those players are more interested in HTTP 3 than the other protocols I mentioned that could possibly follow. But today there is not much advantages of HTTP 3 for them. They tie your CPU, for example, everything on cloud. Well, I think for, for those, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know exactly how they view the business here, or how, but I, I guess that when you're looking at the numbers, all these, I, I'm sure that they will evaluate what advantages they get from a new HTTP protocol compared to using HTTP 2. And I, I imagine that they think that it's an advantage to go to this. Um, I don't know. I don't know how they select that or not. And it'll be interesting to see how, how they will go for <coughs> Who will run HTTP 3 in July and who won't? So, so you are not there as a for those interested in advantages and, and latency? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of them are primarily in here for the latency because the latency is going to be a significant difference, right? Going from nothing to an encrypted connection where you can send a request, that's going to be several round trips faster with HTTP 3 compared to HTTP 2. And as we know, HTTP sites, and especially these big ones, they know how important that those milliseconds are. So maybe it's good for your business to gain X number of round trips. And how, how much gain is that? Probably huge if you're a huge player. Yes, yeah, so uh, Speedy was invented from Google originally, and Quick was also a Google ID originally. Yes. So from, from outside, it feels like Google are the ones driving innovation in this area. Is that so? And yeah, I would say that. I mean, Google, uh, clearly, uh, exactly, clearly Google did speedy, clearly Google did quick, and they brought it to ITF. And so, um, so yes, I think Google drives a lot of this, but I also think that they make it more visible like this when they bring it to the ITF. Some of the other protocol, some of the other players in this area, they they would just you know deploy their own homemade protocol over the internet and be happy with that. I know that there have existed you know transfer protocols done over UDP that has been done for years but mostly from players oh I want to transfer data from there and sell that as a service never take that to the ITF never bother about making a standard and be happy with it so I think a little bit of that that, that Google is keen on making it the standard in, but sure and it also goes back to Google being in an excellent position for them to actually try this out with their huge browser and their huge services so they can actually you know one percentage of their users can try this out, and that's a few million people. But sure, a lot of development and uh, inventions going on from Google. When you want to take one, if you, in your uh, corner, come up with a grand uh, new protocol, I want to do a new protocol. You know, it's going, you want to deploy it on the internet, you want to measure it, you want to come up with numbers, and then take that to the ITF. So it's not, <coughs> It's not that easy for anyone to just come up with a protocol. So it helps if you're if you're a big player and can actually run this for a while and actually measure it and make sure that it actually works. Of course, there are other players that can do that too, but still. 
or we're running out of questions. Finally. But <laughs> <laughs> well, then uh, we are done. Thank you.